uh, now continuing to talk about Immanuel Kant's moral theory. Uh, let us uh, go ahead and see where does he ground his moral theory. Now, he grounds his moral theory on the notion of uh, the good will. This is the starting point of Immanuel Kant's uh, moral theory. Now, I quote from Immanuel Kant himself, there is no possibility of thinking of anything at all in the world or even out of it, which can be good without qualification, except a good will. Intelligence, wit, judgment and whatever talents of the mind one might want to name are doubtless in many respects good and desirable, as are such qualities of temperament as courage, resolution, perseverance. But they can also become extremely bad and harmful, if the will which is to make use of these gifts of nature and which in its special constitution is called character is not good. The same holds with gifts of fortune, power, riches, honor, even health and that complete well-being and contentment with one's condition, which is called happiness make for pride and often hereby uh, even arrogance, unless there is a good will to correct their influence on the mind and herewith also to rectify the whole principle of action and make it universally conformable to its end. The sight of a being who is not graced by any touch of a pure and a good will, but who yet enjoys an uninterrupted prosperity can never delight a rational and impartial spectator. Thus, a good will seems to constitute the indispensable condition of being even worthy of happiness. This is from excerpted from the groundwork for the metaphysics of morals. Now, this as we come across is uh, the foundation of uh, Kant's moral philosophy. Now, till now we have been talking about consequentialism, about utilitarianism, hedonism most of the places where we find that well, uh, there are certain non-moral consequences that are brought forward by acts and that decide on the moral uh, parameter of the act in question. Now, Kant here makes a, uh, rem uh, a break in the tradition and tries to find a moral grounding that is atomic, that is fundamental, that is axiomatic. We talked about uh, how Kant tried to, what were the objectives of Kant. In uh, retrospect, we can see the picture that Kant wanted to paint was where the entire frame of morality laid to rest on uh, rationality. Now, that was a very difficult uh, 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 position to keep, because this was a time when Kant was uh, uh, predominant. At the time that was uh, Kant's time was filled with religion, with uh, uh, societal, with traditional values as being the source of values. Now, can tradition be the source of values? The, uh, the customs and the rules that have been coming out, are they going to be uh, the rules of uh, uh, the current uh, system or is there going to be something else? As we talked earlier, that Kant wanted to cleanse his system, he wanted to clean uh, uh, the moral system of all external evidences or of all empirical evidences and wanted to ground it on rationality. Now, he introduces this notion of the good will. Now, what is the good will? The good will seems to be that whenever uh, uh, all, all conditions, all capacities, all potencies in the world are uh, however desirable or undesirable they be, uh, are by themselves not good without any qualification. That is, we require certain qualifiers to make it good. Let us say a, a, a strong uh, human being, a well physically well built strong human being. Now, is that strength a good thing or a bad thing is qualified by how that person uses his strength. Does he use the strength to bully others? Does he use his strength to uh, assist others in uh, need? 
Now, this uh, uh, entity called the good will is what makes a difference to all other properties in the world. That is what Kant is trying to bring to light, that nothing inside or outside the world is good without a qualification. So, everything is good or bad depends on certain qualifications, except the good will. The good will is the fundamental uh, atomic goodness that we see. Now, Kant gives, uh, uh, looking at the slide, we see that Kant gives certain examples of uh, character, power, riches, honor, even health and complete well-being and contentment. Uh, so, he even talks about courage, resolution, perseverance. That whatever these qualities are, they are good or bad depending on the good will. So, then he later talks about that the sight of a being, who is not graced by any touch of a pure and good will, but yet enjoys an un uninterrupted prosperity, can never delight a rational impartial spectator. Thus, a good will seems to constitute the indispensable condition of being even worthy of happiness. Now, what does Kant mean, when he says that, uh, uh, that a pure and good will, but who yet enjoys an uninterrupted prosperity, can never delight a rational and impartial spectator. Let us take the example of a movie. Why do we like the film star, the hero, the protagonist of the movie? Let us take a usual plot, where the protagonist is strong, tough, has uh, overcome challenges to preserve good. Now, we, uh, when we are talking about the, imp uh, when Kant talks about the impartial, impartial and rational spectator, he means us as rational beings, who do we uh, attach value to, or who is the protagonist? The protagonist is one, who not only is strong, and that strength does not make him the protagonist, for very often the antagonist or the villain is much stronger than the uh, hero. But what makes the hero hero is the good will, is the good will without any qualification, that he has the good will, that he has a good intention, that he is a good person. These are things that make uh, the agent a uh, uh, hero. So, this is what uh, a life on uninterrupted prosperity, will still not delight the impartial and rational spectator, because it would not make a difference, or it would not inspire the uh, spectator, unless the spectator saw the evidence of the goodness, or of goodness of qualification. Now, coming to the next slide. Now, good will for Kant is at the center of ethics. What does he briefly do? Kant attempts to bring the locus of the moral domain, from theories, empirical observations, back to the individual, in the individual's exercise of moral choice and freedom. Morality cannot be based on the evidence of the senses, and that persons have an inherent, inherent sense of morality. The objective, the objective of an act is to be called moral, is not benefit, pleasure or satisfaction. An act is moral, only if it is done from a sense of duty, and nothing else. The objective of an act, so as to be called moral, is not benefit, pleasure or satisfaction, but an act uh, is moral, only if it is done from a sense of duty, and nothing else. Certainty comes from the mind, and not empirical evidences, in actively ordering the evidence of the senses. Now, what is Kant trying to say here? First, that Kant attempts to bring the locus of the moral domain, from theories, empirical observations, back to the individual, in the individual's exercise of moral choice and freedom. 
So, again this is a part of Kant's agenda to clear morality from the uh, from empirical uh, sources or from evidence of the senses. And he is making a crucial claim here, that persons have an inherent sense of morality. So, the objective of an act, so as to be called moral, is not benefit, pleasure or satisfaction. An act is moral, if it is only done from a sense of duty and nothing else. Now, this is very crucial in understanding what Kant uh, is trying to put forth. This is a crucial claim of Kant, that well, uh, the moral act is a conformity to the sense of duty, and is not done for pleasure, or benefit, or even satisfaction. Now, if uh, I can't were to ask Mother Teresa, that why do you serve the needy? And if Mother Teresa would reply, that well I serve the needy, because my heart uh, goes out for the needy. I am touched, I am moved, I am emotionally charged. Uh, when I see the needy, and therefore, I serve the needy. To this uh, hypothetical dialogue, Kant would reply, that well, Mother Teresa, you are not moral in that sense, because you are not functioning out of a sense of duty, but you are uh, 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 your moral, your supposed moral uh, uh, acts are from your empathy, from the pleasure, or from the satisfaction that you derive from serving the needy. It is not from a sense of duty. It is not a cold, uh, calculated, dispassionate sense of duty. Rather, it is a warm feeling of uh, affection, oneness and mercy, that is prompting you to the to action. So, that makes your action less, uh, the, that strips your action of its morality. So, the sense of duty is non-negotiable. The sense of duty is the only source of action. Now, so therefore, the certainty that comes for moral actions and moral claims come from the mind, and not from empirical evidences. So, uh, empirical evidences just provide you the data, the mind orders the data. Now, let us go to the next slide. What the uh, Kant talks about this thing called the categorical imperative, very often abbreviated as the CI. What is the categorical imperative? the test to determine the right from the wrong. That is this, in a single uh, claim, is what Kant means by the categorical imperative. The principle to determine the right, it can be known a priori, that is by reflection alone, as it is a part of our mental structure. Categorical as opposed to hypothetical, or goal based imperative, because it is a must, or is a binding. First, let us talk about these two claims. Now, what does categorical imperative mean? Now, the categorical imperative would perhaps mean, uh, not perhaps, but would definitely mean, uh, uh, something of a rule, of a moral command. Now, let us look at the board, to see what, uh, how best can we understand categorical imperative. This is quite a profound concept, that uh, Kant has come up with. And we are just skimming at the introductory level, to present a brief overview of what Kant's philosophy is. Now, there are judgments we do, if I want x, I would or ought to do y, right. Now, look at these two. If I want x, I would do y, a fairly simple conditional statement. Now, this is something, which is called a 
hypothetical imperative. This part of it is hypothetical and this part of it is an imperative or a command. Now, this is basically the structure of most uh, uh, moral judgments or most policies, maxims that we have in our uh, lives that well, we want something and to achieve that, we do certain things. So, I want x and I ought to do y to get x. This is an example of a hypothetical imperative. Now, let us look at an example of a categorical imperative. Well, it is something like an absolute moral command, which just says do z. If you want, we can fill this up with no matter what. Now, the categorical imperative is saying that well, no matter what do z. So, there is something absolute about the categorical imperative. Okay. Now, let us not uh, uh, get confused with the words and the phrases that uh, Kant uses. What categorical imperative essentially means is that well, there are some things right, which are categorical. Categorical meaning they have to be done. right? Uh, they are an imperative, because they are a command, a command which is categorical or which is uh, to be followed for its own sake. It is not hypothetical, it is not a command or an imperative to be followed for some goal, but it is an imperative or a command to be followed for its own sake. Now, here is where Kant is unfolding his moral theory that it comes about that well, there are things that ought to be done for its own sake. right? Now, let us take a look at the slide. When, uh, there, uh, when we uh, talk about hypothetical, it is goal based, because it is a must or a binding, but the categorical imperative is done for its own sake. Now, let us look at Kant presented three formulations of the categorical imperative. The first formulation reads, act only on that maxim, which you can at the same time will to be a universal law. Now, this is a small uh, sentence, but which puts forth the first formulation of uh, the categorical imperative. It says that act only on that maxim, which you can at the same time, will to be a universal law. Now, what does it say? Well, what does a maxim mean? A maxim is a subjective principle of judgment. Let me write that on the slide for your clarity. It means a subjective principle of action. Right. Okay. Act on that maxim or that subjective principle of action, which you can at the same time will to be a universal law. Now, let us uh, say, what these are words that we are using categorical imperative maxim, 
we are using these words, these phrases which are directly from Kant and thereby let it not confuse you or uh, make it sound superfluous. These are words used by uh, uh, or translations from Kant's works, but what we mean in essence is crucial for you to understand that well, Kant is saying that well, what the first axiom or the f uh, first formulation, it is not an axiom, it is a first formulation of the categorical imperative and as you can see it is empty, it is bereft of any content, it does not claim that there are any, uh, that th uh, there is any description of what one must do, he just puts a formula and what is that formula? The formula reads that act only on that maxim which you can at the same time will to be a universal law. Now, what is Kant saying? Kant is saying that well, anything to do, what is this filter of right, uh, rightness checker, which we call, he calls the categorical imperative. Any act is right, if the principle with which you act can be universalized. That is, if you are uh, okay, uh, being the recipient of the act, rather than the doer of the act, then or you, uh, the act is right. If you are okay, if the maxim or the subjective principle of action is generalized, is is universalized, is everybody starts following that. If is that okay with you? He gives a rather interesting example. Uh, he takes this example of uh, asking for a loan when one knows that one does not have the capacity to uh, repay the loan. Now. Kant uh, postulates a situation that well, a person who is in need of uh, uh, money and has to ask for a loan, knowing fully well that he cannot repay the loan, is in a quandary. Because if he asks for a loan, saying that well, he cannot repay it, he would not get a loan. And if he asks for a loan, uh, promising that he would repay it, he is uh, uh, clearly saying something which he cannot do, or he clearly committing to something which he cannot do. Now, it is the latter that Kant thinks is a challenge to the rationality of the agent. Now, if the agent uh, assumes that uh, uh, he is able to fool the one who is extending the loan, and commit uh, a repayment, whereas even while the time of accepting the loan he knows that he is not in a position to repay, then that person is guilty of not just breaking a promise, but of being irrational, of not being uh, a rational human being, of belittling his rational human agency. Now, how does he do so? Let us look at the slide to understand how he does so. Well, now an ununiversalizable maxim is involved in the contradiction of will. Now, this is a term that we need to pay, in at, pay attention to. Well, what Kant means by contradiction of will, is the uh, difficulty or error arising from breaking one's commitment or breaking or more accurately, violating the categorical imperative. Now, let us look at this case that is uh, put on the slide. X makes a promise and X violates the promise when suitable, for by the very act of making a promise X. Let us look at this example. Uh, X let us say, x makes a promise, and x violates the promise when suitable. For by the very act of making a promise, x does something, say p, and then by violating it, he does, uh, when suitable, does something called, does something which can be termed as negating p. Now, x asserts p very well, knowing that she or he would negate p later. This is the contradiction of will that Kant points out. So, uh, let us look at this, what is, what, what is wrong with the contradiction of will, or what does Kant mean by the contradiction of will. Now, 
the categorical imperative is a binding, is a binding or is a sense of duty that comes to us from our own rationality. It is not something which is uh, enforced by anybody else. Let me make it simpler. Well, when you feel that there is something that you must do, no matter what, that it is your duty to do uh, that particular act, then you are functioning from uh, a sense of duty, which in certain interpretations could be the categorical imperative. Let us uh, uh, take the example of a doctor, to whom an, uh, an injured terrorist or an extremist or a criminal, an injured criminal has come for treatment. Now, the oath of uh, um, the doctor is to uh, provide treatment to any uh, patient or any victim or any injured who comes to him. But knowing this, that well, if he does uh, uh, extend treatment to this particular patient of his, there might be more harm than benefit to people at large, for the uh, patient is none other than a criminal, who is most likely to do something wicked or evil, if he is rendered back to his health. Now, what does the categorical imperative here say? The categorical imperative is your sense of duty, it is well what you would like uh, to be done to you. Uh, if you, uh, uh, it is like the uh, religious adage that do unto others what you would like others to do to you. Now, the categorical imperative here uh, would be to do what you, uh, what is your call of duty. Now, look at it uh, in on the slide. Now, when um, X is asserting something that well, you should do this, or he makes a false uh, in this particular case of loaning he makes a false promise, that he can repay the loan. He is actually contradicting his will, contradicting himself, because he is asserting something, which he uh, knows, that he would negate later. Asserting P, fully knowing that, it would be negated later. So, considering the doctor example too, when the doctor provides treatment to the patient, who happens to be a criminal, well if the doctor just does his duty, then he is not contradicting his will. But well, if he has uh, this sense of duty, that he should help all, then uh, he brings, uh, by not helping or not treating the criminal, he does something, which is contradicting his will. Now, there have been other formulations of the categorical imperative. Uh, there are three formulations, that Kant has come up uh, himself with. Now, notice that all these uh, formulations, or of the categorical imperative, are bereft of any content. They are just forms, right. Now, the second formulation says that, act, so that you treat humanity, whether in your own person, or in that of another, never as a means only, but always at the same time, as an end. So, this brings into uh, focus, that well, we must use, or we must uh, uh, see each individual, each person as a end in himself, right. Now, this also interestingly, has many ramifications, especially in political philosophy, that we are all equal on the moral plane. This is the claim, that is coming out from this formulation. The third formulation, or autonomy formula, would say that the idea of the will, of every rational being, being as a will that legislates universal law, right. So, that we are all autonomous. Now, we need to, um, need not to go in further detail, about these uh, formulations, unless until we would like to make a specialized study of Kant. Now, uh, coming to the next slide. Now, 
it is rumored or it is said that well Kant being a bachelor himself uh, had a man servant of sorts with him to look after his daily needs and the both uh, they both loved each other uh, and he, the man servant was of course a simpleton and when Kant narrates his philosophy after a long uh, uh, decade of or decades of writing the man servant is amazed that well you have taken and he almost accuses Kant that you have taken morality away uh, from religion and God and perhaps you have nothing to cater for in morality uh, in, in religion and that uh, it is rumored struck Kant so much that he invented these or he brought uh, conjectured these postulates of morality that uh, in uh, uh, a conceited way or in a hidden way bring back uh, the notion of God that his man servant was very much looking forward to. Well, we will just briefly go over these postulates of morality. First, it says that the freedom of the will to experience moral choice and therefore, thereof to arrive at the sense of duty, one has to have the freedom of the will, existence of God. Um, acting out of the sense of duty must eventually lead to happiness in the long run, if not in the short run. And this can be possible if the world is designed so. So, there must be a designer God fairly self explanatory the conjecturing the existence of God to present that do acting once by one sense of duty must eventually lead to happiness or is that consequentialism creeping into Kant's system. Now, and the third one is the immortality of the soul acting out of duty may cause harm and pain in the short run. So, there has to be an immortal soul as the agent to achieve sought in this lifetime. So, it is very often seen that living by one duty uh, might actually cause more pain and harm in the short run. So, uh, Kant conjectures that there has to be an immortal soul that benefits from the good um, that could be accumulated over time. So, ultimately bo uh, um, these postulates are trying to hint especially the second two postulates are could be accused of uh, uh, letting in consequentialism from the window. Now, these postulates are uh, according to Kant are implied in our sense of moral obligation. Now, let us sum up. So, briefly what is Kant's position? Kant wanted to establish a moral system on the unshakable foundations of reason or rationality indifferent to the less sturdy foundation of empirical evidence. Moral choice is the basis of asserting free will, moral acts only emerge from a sense of duty. Drawing satisfaction out of the performance of a moral act strips the act of its morality. Morality is always a matter of conscious choice, duty is to be performed only for its own sake that is duty for duty's sakes, sake. This is also known as rigorism as attributed to Kant. So, let us now sum up that well uh, Kant in his uh, in the deontological tradition, uh, which we have taken the first example of a deontological rule deontological tradition as Immanuel Kant. The second example we will be taking next is W. D. Ross. Now, Immanuel Kant as an example of uh, the rule deontological tradition tries to ground morality on uh, rationality and makes morality uh, 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 an atomic affair, it does not make morality depend on any non moral consequences. And what is it that enforces morality? It is nothing but one's own rationality that enforces morality. For when one uh, uh, violates the categorical imperative, one brings in the contradiction in will and this contradiction in will is violating one's morality. So, this contradiction in will uh, sorry is a symptom of uh, um, irrationality or 
the denial of rationality so intrinsic and valuable to human beings. So, what is the categorical imperative? It is briefly the principle of universalizability. It has three formulations. Uh, it talks about well that um, an act is right only if it can be universalized. So, what in principle or in essence is uh, the universalizability claim? That well, I as an individual have no special rights or special position on the moral plane. So, uh, if I assume that anybody in my situation would uh, act like this, uh, suppose I choose an act x. Now, if anybody in my situation uh, could or should you act x, then this is uh, a right thing to do. So, the categorical imperative is the filter for determining right from wrong. It is a rule, but nevertheless it is a rule without any content. It is a rule of a form. It is giving one a form, a form that well, uh, we if, if this is the situation, we place it in the form and then if it is universalizable, then it is right. If it is not universalizable, it is wrong. Let us take an example. If we think that well, uh, anybody who is poor should steal. Uh, I am poor today and uh, I would steal from the rich and if I am, uh, this is right only if I would consider that anybody who is poor, perhaps poorer to me or that one day I become rich and she or he steals it from me, then it becomes universalizable. But then there are again various uh, uh, issues with universalizability. Say something, uh, of course, Kant talks about uh, this too, that if uh, some we could universalize something as uh, trivial as tying one's left shoe string first every time. So, yes, Kant does refine his theories to incorporate. Uh, it is a detailed exhaustive theory to, uh, uh, which has its essential grounding as we have discovered and uh, uh, as we have talked about that its essential grounding is always on uh, uh, the categorical imperative or on the content that universalizability as the criteria of determining right of there being a rule not being a, a, of a contentless rule in discerning the right from the wrong. With this, we come to a uh, close of our discussion on Immanuel Kant's uh, moral philosophy.